Bibles with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 18. As we conclude this week, our study of uh, the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 18, and beginning at verse 1. It says, Now when he, Jesus, was telling them a parable to show them, first of all, that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Jesus wants his children to pray. He wants them to pray frequently. He wants them to pray intently. He wants them to not give up. I mean, I understand sometimes my prayers are, God, I want it. I want it now. And please, please don't make me wait for it. Verse 2, Jesus said, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God, and who did not respect man. This judge lacked any spiritual or social skills. Such a judge would not take God's word literally or seriously. He would refuse to have the Ten Commandments displayed on court property. Such a judge would not respect the sanctity of life because he did not respect humanity. Such a judge would rule out of the relativity of the moment, of what he thought was right at the moment. He would legislate from the bench rather than uphold the standards of God's morality or society's norms. Such a judge, according to the scriptures, is a fool. We know that we have such a judicial system today throughout our Western culture. Judges who have no regard for God and really no regard for humanity. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. It is foolish to not at least acknowledge a supreme being. Where there's a creation, there's a creator. Where there's a design, there's a designer. Where there's a watch, there's a watchmaker. Where there is art, there is an artist. These people, the psalmist said, are corrupt. They have committed abominable actions in their heart and deeds. There is not one of them that does good. Solomon said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. This was a perverse judge who cared nothing about God and nothing about humanity. But the parable goes on in verse 3. There was a widow in that city... And she kept coming to him, kept coming and coming and coming, and saying to the judge, give me legal protection, or the word is justice. Give me legal protection. Give me justice from my opponent. Widows and orphans were particularly vulnerable in ancient Near Eastern history. Exodus 22 22 commands, you shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you afflict them at all, and if he or she cries to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my anger as God will be kindled against those who oppress the widow. Psalm 65, 68.5 says, A father of the fatherless and a judge and protector for the widows is God in his holy habitation. Yes, God cares about those who are hurting and downtrodden. But this judge really didn't care. Verse 4, For a while he was unwilling to protect her, but afterwards he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God, nor do I respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. Her persistence of coming and coming and asking for justice, the word that is translated in English, she shall wear me out, is a figure of speech. We have it in our language also. She's going to give me a black eye. (laughs) She's going to give me a bad reputation 
if I don't do something for her. She just keeps coming and asking and asking. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect? Will he not care for his children who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you that God will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus says, just like this widow who kept asking and asking this irreverent and unsociable, unrighteous judge for justice, and finally she got it, so you, her, you the children of God, you will get answers from a God who is just, from a God who loves you, from a God who cares about you. In Genesis, Moses says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? As we look at our society today and we begin to see really the breakdown of our judicial system, the breakdown of, of, of righteousness, we see uh, the breakdown of society. God wants us to be assured that he will answer our prayers, that he will watch over us, that he will provide justice and protection. Judges have huge authority, and if they don't have it, they just take it. And Jesus in this parable is saying to us, look, pray, pray, pray. Pray for God's will. Pray for the things that uh, you would like God to do in your life. Pray for justice and righteousness and be confident that God will answer that prayer. In the final book of the Bible and of the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 6, the time that is known as the Great Tribulation, the time when uh, great uh, catastrophic troubles fall upon the earth and uh, believers are persecuted throughout this world. The slain are said to cry out to God, Oh God, how long, holy and true God, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long is it going to be before you bring justice? And they are assured that it will be just a little while. Be patient, my children. God is going to make everything just and right someday. Jesus says, pray, pray at all times. In verse 9, he tells us another parable. He also told the parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Jesus always had round about him the religious people who just thought that they were so wonderful. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and the Herodians, and, and usually they were often the, the wealthy. And they looked at everyone else with contempt. And, and this particular word means to look down your nose at other people. To look down and say to them, you don't count. You're not important in society. God doesn't care about you. They had contempt for them. And then Jesus tells this parable. This parable, this story that was probably all too common. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other the tax collector. Of course, the Pharisees were normally fairly well-off or wealthy, middle class to upper middle class at the very least. Uh, they were very religious, keeping all of the laws. And of course, the tax collectors, in some ways, were naturally looked down as because, you know, they had a tendency to cheat the people. We have the tax collector Zacchaeus, you remember, in the New Testament, who had to give back multiple times the money he had taken from people after he became a Christian or a believer in Jesus. Two men went up to the temple to pray. 
Well, the Pharisee came through that beautiful Robinson's archway. He would have walked into the city so proud, up those stairs, into his special box area, you know. He would have had, uh, in the vernacular of today, he would have had, uh, you know, season parking (laughs) pass. He'd have had special uh, rights and everything. And he walked in so proud of himself. Oh, God, you're so lucky that I'm here. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the most righteous of them all? Oh, it is I, it is I. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. I'm not a swindler. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. Or even like that tax collector back there. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Oh, God, I'm so wonderful. You're so fortunate to have me. Now, this was a Pharisee who was over the top with his religion. In the Old Testament, there was only one fast going without food one time a year on the Day of Atonement. By the time of Zechariah, some thousand years later, they had turned it into four days of fasting. He said, I fast twice a week. If my math is right, that's like a hundred plus times, isn't it? He was over the top with his zeal. And he says, I pay tithes on all that I get, not just on, uh, on the net, uh, but on the total. Not the after taxes, but the before taxes, you know? I, I, I tithe on everything. I am in such great standing before God because of my religion. Now, let's kind of parallel that. I suppose a Baptist might say today, I read my King James Bible. I've walked the church aisle. I've said the sinner's prayer. I'm good before God. A Mormon might say, now be baptized as a Mormon. Join the Mormon church. Serve two years as a missionary. Marry another Mormon, and God's lucky to have you. A Jehovah's Witness might say, be baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. Take catechism. Join the Jehovah's Witness church. Witness door to door. Marry a Jehovah's Witness and then hope that you can be one of the 144,000 and be one of the elite to make it into heaven. Of course, a Jew might say, I'm sorry, a Hindu might say, read the holy books. Attend temple. Don't eat beef. Hope for good karma in the next reincarnation. A Presbyterian might say, be baptized as a baby. Graduate from catechism. Be active in the church and be assured that you're one of the elect. A Catholic might say, be baptized as a baby. I attended catechism. I completed my first communion. I've married a Catholic. I give to the church. I do good works. I attend confession. And I hope to make it into purgatory. And I hope that if I make it into purgatory that my family will love me enough to have a special mass to spring me out of purgatory into heaven. A Unitarian. What would a Unitarian say today? You know, Unitarians don't believe much. They would basically say, Akuna Matata, you know, there are no worries, Akuna Matata, God loves us all, there's no judgment. A Muslim would say, right, recite the Klima, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. The Muslim would say, pray five times a day towards Mecca. Fast during Ramadan. Give alms and make trips to Medina and to Mecca. Every world religion and so many denominations have these steps 
that they go through to, to say to God, oh God, I'm so wonderful, I'm so righteous, I'm not like those other pagans. And this Pharisee was just spouting the Judaism of the day. I'm going to work my way to heaven by being such a wonderful person. Verse 13, but the tax collector, standing some distance away, I mean, he couldn't even bring himself to get close to the Holy of Holies. He felt so unworthy. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven but he was beating his breast, which was a, a cultural sign or gesture of, I deserve judgment, I am wrong, I am a sinner. And all he said was, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. That tax collector, who is simply willing to say, God, I'm a sinner, and I throw myself on the mercy of your forgiveness. I acknowledge to you, I do not deserve to be your child. I do not deserve to dwell in heaven with you. God, just please be merciful to me. And that poor tax collector went out justified before God. He probably went out those same poor man gates, but yet he was rich in eternal inheritance because he had understood the very one thing that we must do as people, and that is to acknowledge that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Isaiah 64, 6, For all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like filthy garments and rags in the sight of God. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. James says it this way, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of God, and then God will exalt you. Galatians chapter 2, Paul, arguing with the Jews, says to them, Nevertheless, knowing this, that no one, no man, is justified by the works of the law. You cannot keep the Ten Commandments. You can't even keep two commandments. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we might be justified, we might be right in the sight of God by faith. By faith in Christ Jesus, not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no one be justified. That Pharisee had it totally wrong. It wasn't by his good works that he became a Christian or a believer. It wasn't by his good works he was justified. It wasn't by his good works that he enters into heaven. But it is by the good work of one person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and by having faith in him. Romans 4, 5 says, To the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we get peace with God? Simply by faith. By acknowledging, God, I'm a sinner, I'm lost, there's nothing that I can do, but thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose again, and I accept your forgiveness. 
at that time, the parents, they were, verse 15, bringing even their babies to him so that he might touch them. Matthew tells us that the purpose for which Jesus was touching them was to pray for them. Uh, Throughout uh, Jewish culture, even uh, Islamic culture and others, um, blessings from God was something that uh, parents coveted. And uh, the shepherd or the pastor or the elder, as the representative of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, prays for children, for God's blessings upon their lives. But the people understood who Jesus was in part, and so they wanted to bring their children to Jesus, this great rabbi. And that Jesus would sit there and he would take each child into his arms and he would pray for God's blessings upon them. Well, when the disciples saw this happening, they got in the way. Get back! The language is very strong. Get back! Don't bother Jesus! Don't bother Jesus. Take these children out of here. He's got more important things to do. (laughs) But Jesus called to them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and you better not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. To receive the kingdom of God as a child is to receive it simply, purely, by trust. To come to the understanding that there's just nothing that I can do but accept everything that God has done. How can I add to the death of Jesus Christ? How can I add to the sufferings of Jesus Christ? Anything that I try to add but subtracts from his great sacrifice, any kind of catechism, any kind of walking the aisle, any kind of uh, missionary trips or uh, giving of money, all that does is it detracts from what God did. What What we say to God when we think we have to do something is saying, Well, God, thanks for the good effort you made, but it just wasn't quite enough. You need my help. No. The children came to Jesus, and Jesus blessed them in the simplicity of their faith and trust. Psalms 127.3 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And I would add in parentheses, and there's no return policy. (laughs) Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. And we all have to become like little children if we are going to enter in to a faith relationship with him. Well, there are three applications that I'd like to make this morning from these parables. The first one is about prayer. You know, James says to us, you do not have because you do not ask. Because sometimes you ask with the wrong motives so that you can spend it on your pleasures. James says we should pray, but we need to pray for the right things. We need to pray for God's will for our lives. We need to pray for God's good things for our life. And we need to be very persistent about it. Beloved, don't give up in praying for the good things of God. Don't get discouraged and say, oh God, come on, hurry up. At the right time, at the best time, God will provide the best answer. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no change or shifting shadow. God will withhold no good thing to those who walk uprightly. God wants to bless us with the spiritual blessings And yes, we need patience, we need perseverance, but keep, keep praying. Secondly, for the Pharisee and the tax collector, let us not confuse the gospel. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered to you that which is of first importance, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Romans chapter 5, Paul says to us, But God demonstrated his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more now, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath or judgment of God that comes. We shall be saved through the death of his son. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up, delivered him up on the cross for all of us, how will he not so much give us everything, forgive us everything, who can bring a charge against one of God's elect children? God is the one who justifies. Who will ever condemn the child of God? It is Christ Jesus who has died, yes, rather who has also been raised, who is at the right hand of God and who intercedes for us forever. Once we exercise that simple faith and acknowledge God, I'm a sinner, Jesus is the Savior, and I'm trusting him for my salvation. We are secure. We are his children. And we will never come unto judgment. As many as receive him, to those he has given the right or the authority to become the children of God. And then lastly, the children coming to the Lord Jesus. We need to value Christian education in our homes and in our churches for our children. We need to be involved in the Christian education, and particularly we dads. We need to take that leadership of prayer, of setting an example, of, of teaching the Word of God, raising our children up in the fear and warnings or admonitions of the Lord so that they might be able to walk in the blessed life that God has for each and every one of us.